Hello, everybody, and welcome to MeTech's COVID-19 webinar series. Today's webinar is going to focus on one of the really hot topics that we've had throughout this pandemic, which is COVID-19 testing strategies. My name is Amanda Grendel, and I will be your moderator today. I am one of MeTech's faculty members, and I am really excited to be here. So today we have two wonderful speakers who are going to give us their perspectives from their institutions in regards to testing strategies. First, we'll hear from Dr. Yaffe, and then we'll hear from Dr. Ball. I will then come back on and give you some of our resources, and we will have a question and answer session if we have time at the end. So those of you who don't know who we are, NETEC, or the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center, is a federally funded collaborative that is um, here to increase the capability of the U.S.'s public health and healthcare systems in order to safely and effectively manage individuals with suspected and confirmed special pathogens. We'll talk a little bit later about um, all of our resources at the end, and I'll go through just a little bit in a minute. But just so you know, we do have a website at www.needtech.org that has a really expansive um, kind of list and repositories of things there uh, that you can access. Also, if you can't find what you're looking for or you have a specific question that you would like answered, or if you just need some assistance, please feel free to email us at info at and someone will get back to you shortly. So a little bit about what we do. We do have several um, kind of branches within NETEC. Um, first, we do offer um, an assessment branch. So those are anything from self-assessments. We help um, define metrics um, that help um, uh, facilities be able to just assess their readiness. And um, before the pandemic and hopefully after, uh, we will be able to go back to on-site um, assessments. Currently, they are being done uh, virtually. Another branch we have, which is one of our largest branches, is education. We have many online trainings. We offer also offer in-person courses. Again, right now, they're being more offered kind of as long webinars or things that we're doing um, today, for instance, for COVID-19. We also have technical assistance that can be on-site or remote. Um, we also have a very large repository, um, again, kind of what I alluded to earlier, that has lots of documents, lots of resources and tools for you in there. We also have a whole um, section dedicated to exercise templates based on HC models um, that are really just plug and play and really easy to use for you at your institution and you can customize them as you need them. And we also have um, an on-call system as well. And last but not least, we do have a research um, network. We have the online repository again, which includes a lot of those research articles, databases and things like that. We also use this um, kind of infrastructure to help develop policies, procedures, and capture a lot of data. Um, and then again, we also have created um, a specimen bio repository. We don't do research, but we have the infrastructure to help facilitate that. So great, now that you know about um, us at NETEC, we're gonna get on to the um, exciting part of our presentation today. First, we're gonna hear from Dr. Yaffe, and I'm gonna let her introduce herself, and then we'll hear from Dr. Ba. So I'm gonna let Dr. Yaffe go ahead and um, talk about her experiences from her institution. Dr. Yaffe? So my name is Anna Yaffe, and I'm an emergency physician um, and assistant professor of emergency medicine at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and at Grady Memorial Hospital, which is our urban um, hospital in Atlanta. So I wanted to give you a little bit on my perspective um, in Georgia, um, taking care of COVID over the last several months, and then kind of our strategies um, in testing. I will say that um, both of our presentations, myself and my colleague, Dr. Baus, are um, just our own perspectives on testing. And I think that testing is really uh, um, something very individual to an institution and to a region based on your community prevalence, based on the needs of your institution in terms of maintaining elective procedures, um, the ability to cohort and to use PPE. And so we'll go through um, some of the, the, the challenges that we face and the decisions that we made um, 
um, throughout this process and are still changing to date. And I will say that um, neither of our presentations are by any means the gold standard. These are just what we have done to adapt. Um, throughout this, we would love to hear your questions and your comments um, um, as we move along. And it will be really interesting to have a dialogue to really hear from you and to discuss what, what options are around the country and what's being done. So um, this is the uh, epidemic curve in Georgia for COVID-19 cases. Um, for those of you that um, have not looked at an epidemic curve before, that includes time on the x-axis and number of cases on the y-axis. So as we are um, now, uh, this is a couple days old now, but um, entering July 1st, you can see that our trajectory, unfortunately, is um, steadily rising and I will say anecdotally that we've seen our highest numbers of single day diagnoses um, over this past week and most of these have been in actually younger patients so we're worried that um, the early lifting of social distancing um, regulations may have had a play in this next peak. Um, so I will say that our hospital system is mainly in a couple of counties in Georgia, and those are the ones that unfortunately are highlighted by the red um, county lines on this map. So we're in some of the highest um, community prevalence cases, areas. As we go through thinking about testing um, at Emory Healthcare, I want to go through our traditional um, elementary investigative thought process of who, what, when, where, and why. Um, so we want to talk about who gets tested, what type of test should be used, when should testing occur, where should testing occur, and probably most importantly, why should a patient be tested. So let's take that first question first. Why do we feel a patient should be tested? So here at Emory Healthcare, there's um, a number of reasons why we may want to test a patient. Um, so we know that um, as public health professionals, testing is one of the hallmarks of public health investigation and outbreak response. By testing, we'll be able to identify patients um, and um, provide public health mitigation. So, so for us, we, we separate this into two um, buckets of patients. Um, the first is if a patient is symptomatic, we may test them for risk stratification. Um, so to understand um, whether or not they could um, be at higher risk for um, poor outcomes, if they have comorbidities and they're symptomatic, it's important to know their COVID positive status. Uh, if they're symptomatic, we also test them for infection control precautions so that we can be sure that we're using the appropriate PPE and using the appropriate precautions on symptomatic patients. And also a result of a positive test on a symptomatic patient will help us guide our management, including novel therapeutics um, like remdesivir and other um, novel um, interventions that may be specific to COVID positive patients. The second reason we may test a uh, symptomatic person is for help with public health mitigation. So that is, um, even if the patient is not very sick and does not require hospital admission, um, making recommendations for self-isolation at home, we may test them for contact tracing and quarantine, um, and then also to have accurate data on our community prevalence of um, COVID-19 to guide policy in our area. Secondly, if a patient is asymptomatic, it's important to still consider testing. For us, that includes um, the ability to understand our true underlying community prevalence. So we think of it as a um, public health intervention that we can provide and a service to our community. It may be part of a public health outbreak investigation. So, um, so if we are looking at working up a small cluster of cases that we have within our hospital, within our staff, or within our community, um, that would be another reason to test asymptomatic patients. So then, of course, the risk mitigation can take place by recommending um, quarantine, additional contact tracing, or, and isolation. We are also using this now for risk mitigation and for um, infection control precautions. So um, for pre-procedural risk mitigation, this is sort of our newest um, uh, 
testing realm where we're testing patients before surgeries and other procedures involving anesthesia. And that's really to um, make sure that our OR staff, our anesthesiologists and our anesthetists and our surgeons are appropriately protected and we're doing the appropriate um, interventions to take care of the room and the patient before and after their procedure. We're also looking for patients with high risk comorbidities to look for um, risk of worse outcomes so that we can consider admission and other intervention should a patient come back positive. And finally, um, for admitted patients, we're testing them even if they're asymptomatic so that we can continue to um, use the appropriate infection control precautions like cohorting and other interventions. And we'll discuss this further in more detail. So moving back to who gets tested, um, as I mentioned, all symptomatic patients who we consider as persons under investigation or PUI who will be tested in our healthcare system. We're also testing all inpatient and observation admissions. So symptomatic or asymptomatic, those patients will be um, tested, and that's to identify our prevalence in our healthcare system and to facilitate infection control and cohorting of those patients. We're also doing pre-procedural testing, and we'll discuss which procedures qualify. We're testing symptomatic healthcare workers um, in order to appropriately isolate and or enable return to work. And then we do have some additional special circumstances such as outbreak investigation, some special um, requirements for patients who may be discharged to communal living situations or may be um, trying to have elective orthopedic procedures um, at, at our affiliate hospital where having even one positive patient in the hospital could derail the elective testing program. And, treat, and the elective surgery program. In terms of pre-procedural testing, we're testing any patient having anesthesia services, any patient with likely inpatient admission following their procedure, interventional oncology procedures, and then any patient who's having a procedure basically in the, near their airway, their mouth, their lungs, or ENT procedures. Um, we're, we're testing GI procedures as well, um, and most of these kind of fall under the general realm of anesthesia services. So these are things that we think um, there's a theoretical risk of transmission of COVID or have a potential to convert from a moderate sedation to an intubation or a higher risk anesthesia procedure. In terms of what type of test we're using, we have struggled, um, as many places around the country have, with the availability of our rapid testing. Um, our rapid testing has unfortunately been fairly limited, and we're mainly using the regular batch testing um, for most of our tests. This test occurs for all admitted patients, uh, patients who are undergoing procedures, and our healthcare workers. And we're running that several times a day in our lab. The turnaround time is usually about six to eight hours, but it's not run overnight. So unfortunately, we don't receive any results on our patients coming back overnight. The rapid test turnaround is uh, one to two hours, but again, um, because of our very limited resources in terms of rapid testing, we've restricted that basically for patients preparing for immediate organ transplantation. So if a patient gets word that they have um, received an organ and are coming in for their surgery, they will receive a rapid test. Um, we're a very large transplant center um, for a number of organs, so this will enable us to continue to offer organs to patients. And at this time, unfortunately, that's really our only um, opportunity to use our limited rapid tests. When we are able to flex back to a time when we have additional rapid test availability, we will use the rapid test um, to, for patients who could be discharged from the emergency department but are going to congregate settings like homeless shelters, psychiatric facilities, or nursing homes um, in order to better um, risk stratify the patients and find the appropriate disposition for them. We're also using um, the rapid test um, when we have the availability for patients who are low risk um, for COVID-19 and need emergent BiPAP. 
For these patients, um, they must have an alternate diagnosis like a CHF, um, COPD, or asthma, um, have a chest x-ray that is not consistent with COVID-19, and um, be able to use BiPAP in addition to a couple other um, requirements. And so those patients would actually be able to be started on BiPAP. Finally, when we have available rapid tests, we will um, be able to use them for patients who can be admitted to the observation unit rather than the full hospital and thus save our hospital capacity and use our observation unit to the fullest extent. So these are pa uh, patients, for example, on respiratory pathways in the observation unit like asthma, COPD, or CHF. If we're able to use the rapid test, then we can rapid test them. And if negative, they can go to the observation unit. The good news is because of these flexing, um, flex, flexing uh, requirements for a rapid test use, we've created one order that will identify the type of test that is, that is ne necessary for the patient. And we're able to flex that order depending on our availability of our rapid testing. So in our, uh, and you can see in the, um, in the image that in our test request, we answer a number of questions. For example, if they are symptomatic, what type of specimen, and in times when we have additional availability rapid testing, we ask about discharge to congregate settings, need for BiPAP, and observation unit stay, so that the EMR will identify which patients need to be um, tested using the rapid test, and this takes it out, the decision point out of the provider's hands. So when does testing occur? Um, so as soon as we consider a patient in the emergency department um, for likely need for an admission or a procedure, we'll go ahead and conduct their tests to increase the um, opportunity for the result to come back before the admission or procedure. For patients who are receiving scheduled or elective procedures, the recommendation is for them to receive it within 72 hours of their procedure. There are a few exceptions that we have identified. Um, one is for patients who are receiving colonoscopies. We've been able to spread it out to 96 hours. And for cases that are occurring on a Tuesday, because of the difficulty with obtaining the, um, the testing over the weekend, they're able to test on the Friday. Um, patients are requested that they self-quarantine after testing and before their procedure to limit the risk of acquisition of the virus between the time they tested and their procedure. And then, of course, for patients who are undergoing organ transplantation, we're testing them on their arrival to the hospital uh, right before their transplant. Where are we doing the test? Um, so mainly these uh, patients are being tested in our emergency departments um, by our emergency department staff. So any patient admitted through the emergency department will receive testing in our ED and also symptomatic patients uh, who have presented for emergency care will be able to be tested through the emergency department. We also have set up outpatient testing clinics where the majority of our pre-procedural testing is occurring. Um, and this uh, test result is really preferred um, for, as a test internally from our facility. We've made a couple exceptions as we do have a large catchment area and patients, especially for transplantation, may be coming from hours away or even out of state. So we have um, created a list of some acceptable third-party vendors for testing um, and um, private labs, but this is the exception rather than the rule. Um, also, symptomatic patients who do not require emergency care are able to go to the testing clinics um, for outpatient testing and management. So we've learned a lot through the last several months, um, and I think it's important to sort of reflect on challenges and pitfalls moving forward, especially as we are beginning to see our second peak. Um, so the first is uh, from a considering the patient and the family perspective um, on this testing. We realized early on that patients were a little bit apprehensive, especially when we went to our full, um, um, full test 
testing on all admitted patients. Patients understandably had a lot of questions about why they were being tested when they didn't have symptoms, what that meant for their family. And at the same time, as we went to this um, universal ad admitted testing strategy, we also restricted our visitor policy to a basically no visitation policy. This uh, required a lot of messaging to the community. And we created a Emory Healthcare webpage where patients can go to understand the resources available to them, what to expect um, when they come to the hospital so that they're not surprised by requiring a test on admission by the no visitation policy. And this just helps to mitigate some um, expectations uh, and kind of en enables the patients to know that we have been doing this to keep them safe. We also created a public outreach campaign with some uh, TV and radio spots to continue to encourage um, patients to still present to the emergency department while, um, while, uh, this, while the outbreak has been ongoing, while letting them know that we're taking um, their safety to heart. Um, we also dealt with things such as patient refusal. So some patients have refused testing. Uh, in those cases, we put together a standard operating procedure guidance and Q&A um, for providers to have a conversation with the patients. We found that a lot of the time, the refusal was just a lack of understanding about why we were doing the test. And once we had that conversation about the, the reasons why we're testing asymptomatic patients, most people agreed to the test. Um, there was a subset that um, did not want the nasal test, um, in which case we um, uh, would sometimes consider with our infection prevention and ID guidance whether or not we could do that as an oral swab instead. Um, and at the extreme, um, of course, a patient could be admitted without testing, but would be placed in precautions um, for COVID and would be required to mask at all times. So it was patient refusal is not a reason not to admit them, but it was more about mitigating that refusal. And the vast majority of patients would agree to testing once, once more, um, more uh, conversation occurred. We also faced, um, as many places have, limitations of our testing availability. We um, peaked, we began to peak pretty early in March and April, and at that time uh, we did not have much testing availability, so we really had to restrict where we were testing in our healthcare system. As we gained more access to tests and access to the rapid test, we were able to flex up our testing strategies. Um, but that, again, has been in flux. Um, we're using a um, community um, website called the Coronavirus Checker uh, that enables the um, members of the community to assess their risk for COVID-19 and determine their strategy. Because sometimes um, the emergency department is often not the best place to have testing occur. And so we can guide people to self-isolate at home as needed versus to seek health care versus to call their physician. So um, it gives another um, uh, access point to the community so that they can um, um, get the information that they need from our healthcare system. We struggled a lot with the requirements for rapid versus our regular batch test, and this has mostly been uh, reagent and material dependent. Ideally, of course, we'd love to have a rapid test on all patients, but the reality is we just don't have the um, materials to do so. So um, it's been heavily regulated and um, thought about by all um, departments. And so if you're somebody that's struggling with um, how to deploy your available testing, having a conversation between all of the um, uh, parties that are uh, uh, stakeholders in the testing arguments is really helpful to really pare down who absolutely needs the rapid test. And then, of course, there's an impact on hospital operations as you increase um, your testing strategy. So, um, for example, for us, we had to decide who we were going to cohort, how we were going to use our PPE as we ramped up our testing. 
when we test an asymptomatic patient, um, we don't um, place them in a cohorted COVID unit. They go into the regular unit and regular precautions with standard PPE until their result comes back. If their result comes back positive, then they'll be transferred to the, um, to the cohorted units um, and cared for further there. We feel fairly comfortable with this strategy because we have a universal masking policy. So all of our patients and our providers and our staff are all masked with surgical masks unless they're caring for a COVID PUI or known positive, in which case they wear the um, surgical, the N95 um, respirators. Because everybody is masked, we feel that the risk of transmission from an asymptomatic patient um, in the time before their uh, test re results is minimal and we feel comfortable using our operation strategy in this way. Um, finally, the last thing I have alluded to is the ever-changing guidelines, which has been something it's been um, hard to keep up with for many of our staff and providers. And so in our emergency department, we have created a um, standard operating procedures living Google document where we can continue to update daily or as often as needed with evolving information. And it's kind of the one-stop shop for everybody to um, head to to get the latest updates, the latest guidelines um, for our practices so that everyone can be on the same page. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague to discuss their testing strategy. Uh, thanks, Dr. Yaffe. Um, and thank you to NETEC for having me here today. Um, so my name is Josh Ball. I am the Assistant Director of Clinical Operations. I'm an Administrative Fellow at Massachusetts General Hospital um, in Boston. And my goal in this presentation um, is to tell you about our COVID-19 testing strategy that we've adopted at Mass General. Um, you know, as Dr. Yaffe mentioned, this is just one approach that we've decided to take, um, but I'm going to delve into some of the details and hope that those will be useful for you. Um, and my goal is to particularly cover what, um, you know, some of the challenges that Dr. Yaffe mentioned um, that I know that many of you are facing as well. So I've been in charge of implementing the testing strategy in our, our emergency department, um, which has had ramifications for infection control and operations throughout our, our whole hospital. And so I'll spend most of my time in this presentation on this aspect of testing. Um, in general, we have sought to find the right balance of ensuring safety for our patients and staff, while also avoiding um, using resources unnecessarily, um, all while you know, promoting efficiency in our hospital operations when possible. Uh, overall, our strategy is cautious, um, but it has become more streamlined over time. In addition to ED testing, I also plan to cover pre-procedural testing, as I know that will be int of interest to people on the call. I am not going to cover much on our outpatient and surveillance testing strategies here, um, although I'm happy to comment on those if there are specific questions. And I think that you'll see that much of our strategy is similar uh, to what Emory has done, but there are some differences, um, some in, based on uh, different availability of resources. So hopefully it'll provide a slightly different perspective. So to begin, I wanna orient you to where we are in Massachusetts on our COVID curve. So we had a large surge of COVID patients starting in March with a peak in late April and then continuing large volumes throughout May. In June, our cases have tapered off and we now only have about 100 to 200 new cases per day across the entire state. Uh, which in contrast to Georgia, these are our lowest numbers that we've seen since the, uh, the pandemic began. In tandem, our percent positive rates for tests in our hospital have also dropped considerably, uh, now into the single low digits. So this informs our current testing strategy uh, to an extent, but much of this policy was created when prevalence was higher, and we've been generally conservative in changing it substantially. The reason for this is because, one, an abundance of caution, but two, there is, of course, uncertainty about how our caseload may change uh, as our state continues its reopening measures and we continue to sort of phase open restaurants and other things that we are now seeing uh, appear to increase the number of cases that happen um, in other parts of the country. So similar to, as Dr. Yaffe mentioned, um, there's three key questions for our ED and hospital-based testing strategy. So the first is, who gets a COVID test when they walk in the door? The second is, who do we treat like they might actually have COVID and maintain strict respiratory precautions with care until we have the results? Um, and this is not everybody we test. Uh, I should point out here that our current policy is that all staff and all patients must be in at least surgical masks uh, at all times, um, unless there's a medical reason why the patient can't be masked, which sounds similar to Emory. And so when I talk about full respiratory precautions, what I'm talking about is an N95, eye protection, a gown, and gloves. Uh, in general, in the ED, we are still advising a cautious approach where we're using N95s off the bat with any patient uh, whose risk for COVID has not yet been identified, but then we peel those off as it's safe. 
And then finally, one of our most challenging questions, um, as it sounds like has been at Emory, has been how to allocate the different types of tests that we have. Um, overall, testing availability hasn't been an issue for us since late March. Um, our lab was able to develop their own assay, and so total testing capacity has been okay. But um, our supply of rapid testing um, is also limited, um, and how we deploy these rapid tests has been both important and controversial at times. So our algorithm for who gets tested is relatively simple. Um, first, anyone our clinicians think might have COVID gets a test. Uh, we have guidelines on what symptoms to consider, but this is ultimately up to this, uh, clinician discretion. And we trust that our staff know at this point um, the disease quite well uh, and who to test. Uh, second, everyone being admitted to the hospital or to our observation unit has to be tested, uh, regardless of symptoms or risk factors. Um, although, as I'll discuss in a minute, not all of these patients are treated with strict respiratory precautions. And then finally, anyone being discharged to a congregate living facility has to be tested, and these include uh, nursing facilities, rehab centers, shelters, and psychiatric facilities. Um, obviously, this is to mitigate uh, COVID spread in these settings, which has been a major issue in our area, as I know it has elsewhere. So this is where things become a bit more nuanced. During our COVID surge for a time, uh, we were treating everyone who walked in the door like they had COVID, uh, with strict respiratory isolation precautions. But as our case rate has dropped, this no longer makes sense. Certainly our registration and our triage teams use full precautions uh, while they perform symptom screening, but people who are considered low risk have those precautions discontinued. So anyone who gets a COVID test because of concern for a COVID symptom is treated with full respiratory precautions. So this seems like a no brainer. Uh, in addition, our infectious disease team has identified a series of epidemiologic risk factors for COVID uh, based on internal hospital data. Um, and patients who have these risk factors full respiratory precautions are used, even if the patient has no symptoms whatsoever, um, until they've had a COVID test that comes back negative. And so these risk factors in our population are being undomiciled or homeless, receiving hemodialysis at a facility, living in any kind of congregate living setting, having been in close contact with a known COVID patient in the last two weeks, or being unable to provide a clear and full history. Um, we use these criteria because we found that um, the rate of positives amongst asymptomatic patients in these categories is much higher um, than in the rest of our asymptomatic population. During our surge of, of COVID, we also use criteria based on neighborhoods with particularly high case rates, but right now we're not doing that because there are no hotspots. So this next discussion um, is gonna be about rapid testing and maybe a little bit idiosyncratic to our hospital because of our current rapid availability, um, but I suspect that many of you are dealing with similar issues. So our rapid tests uh, have a turnaround of about two to three hours and our routine tests take about six to eight hours. So we have enough rapid tests right now for about half of the patients that we end up testing in our AD. Um, as Dr. Yaffe mentioned, our, our lives would be a lot easier if we had enough for everybody, um, but that's not the situation that we have. We actually feel fortunate that we're able to, to run as many as we can right now. So as you can imagine, um, the two to three hour test is something that we can feasibly wait for um, often during an ED stay, whereas six to eight hours tends to be too long to wait for that result back in the ED. And so how we deploy our rapid tests has had important operational impl implications for the whole hospital. Um, it's been a, an area of discussion with infectious disease, with medicine, with surgery, um, with our capacity committed to try and decide how we're gonna best use these tests um, for our patients and our operations. So the population that's been most um, operationally challenging for us is what we call COVID risk, which is the same thing as person under investigation. Um, and these are patients that we are treating with full respiratory precautions um, until their COVID test comes back. And so many of the rooms in our hospital have two beds. And if uh, one person in, in a bed is COVID risk, the other bed has to be empty by our policy. Um, in contrast, a known COVID positive patient can be cohorted with another COVID patient, and then patients who have been cleared of COVID can be cohorted with each other. And so the more of these COVID risk situations that we can clear um, before admission, the fewer bed closures we have in the hospital and the better capacity we have overall. So for this reason, anyone who is tagged as COVID risk, uh, needing full respiratory precautions, who's getting admitted, receives a rapid test in RED. And we are waiting for this result to come back before we admit these patients. Um, in addition, uh, patients who need the test for disposition, such as those going to a shelter, a psychiatric facility, or a SNF, uh, they are also getting a rapid test with the result coming back before we send them to one of those facilities. Everybody else gets the slower routine test, and this includes those being admitted without respiratory precautions or anyone being discharged. Um, you know, not surprisingly, this policy of admitting some patients with their COVID test pending, um, but no enhanced precautions um, did lead to con some, some concerns initially, but our positive rate amongst these asymptomatic uh, no precaution patients has been less than 2% uh, in our hospital. And so this hasn't actually turned out to be a big deal, uh, even though there was some trepidation. 
And then finally, uh, discharging patients with their tests pending uh, has created its own challenges. Um, currently, we have a team who are calling these patients with their results, but this is obviously labor intensive and particularly fraught for patients who may not have phone access um, outside of the hospital. So if we could get rapid testing for all of our discharge patients, that would obviously be better, but uh, we don't have those resources just yet. And so as I mentioned, um, in order for rapid testing to aid us in avoiding bed closures, um, we've instituted a policy where all patients who are quote unquote COVID risk must have their, their test back um, prior to admitting them. And given the imperfect test characteristics of the COVID assays, as we know, uh, unfortunately, a single negative test is not enough to clear all patients of their precaution status. Uh, we've therefore built an EHR platform uh, based on internal data that aids our ED clinicians in knowing which patients can be cleared after a single test. And so I wanted to give you a screenshot of what we created. Um, when a patient is COVID risk and has had a negative test come back, um, our ED providers are able to pull up this screen. And this is sort of a click box tool that asks about epidemiologic risk factors, symptoms, and chest imaging results. And it automatically arrives at a decision about whether the patient can be cleared um, of COVID risk status after one negative test or whether they're gonna need another repeat test in 12 hours. Before we had this tool, uh, we were having to page our infection control team uh, every time we wanted to clear a patient. And obviously this was less efficient and, and cumbersome. And so um, this tool has really been essential for implementing the overall current strategy that we have right now. Um, we spent a lot of time uh, teaching our providers to use it and making sure that they're comfortable using it. Um, and then now uh, trying to get everybody to complete it consistently uh, before patients are admitted. So there's two specific scenarios that add a wrinkle to our process that I wanted to cover. Um, so the first are patients who have had COVID and are now recovered. For some time, uh, we were requiring a negative test result to clear patients of known COVID infection status, but we're not doing this anymore. So if patients have been symptom-free for 72 hours and are at least 14 days out from the start of their infection, or 14 days from hospital discharge if they were admitted for COVID, uh, we consider them recovered without any repeat testing. We're actually recommending against retesting of these patients for at least six weeks um, after they've recovered from COVID, assuming that they remain asymptomatic. And this is because we know that shedding can persist long after infectivity. And so those positive results we were getting back weeks after someone had recovered um, were creating complications for you know, cohorting and isolation, but we didn't think actually reflected um, you know, a risk to anybody else. Since we don't yet know if someone can have COVID twice, if somebody does develop symptoms again, we are retesting them. Um, but if they don't have symptoms, we don't retest for at least six weeks. The second special case is if someone has had a negative test recently. Our policy is that if someone has had negative testing within the past 72 hours and they still have no symptoms, we don't require retesting when they come back to the ED. And you know, as, as Dr. Yaffe mentioned, um, these algorithms can become complicated and we've certainly experienced that um, it's getting harder for our clinicians to employ these correctly every time. Uh, making this even harder uh, has been the fact that the algorithm has changed many times over the course of the pandemic. Um, initial changes were in response to better understanding of COVID, but operational challenges have also necessitated tweaks at times. Uh, for example, our allotment of rapid tests just didn't arrive one week about a month ago, uh, forcing us to make a rapid and transient shift in our strategy um, before then quickly reverting back to what we were doing. And we found that with each version change that we make, uh, adherence to the current protocol gets harder. And so throughout the pandemic, we've tried to keep the algorithms as simple and stable as possible, but particularly at this point where clinicians are getting more and more fatigued of the COVID environment, we've been trying really hard to keep the policies consistent, even if they're not 100% perfect. Um, we've also found that supporting good decisions through the EHR is critical. A better system design is more effective than further education efforts at this point, um, sort of given the amount that we've thrown at our providers. One other thing that we've done that I wanted to share is we put up these QR codes um, throughout our emergency department in the different clinical areas. And when people scan these with their phones, it brings them to a simple website that comes up on their smartphone and provides them with the latest updates for COVID. Um, like Dr. Yaffe mentioned, we also have a Google Doc with sort of more extensive policies that people can access, but we've instituted this um, as a way for people to be able to come to their shift, scan this with their phone, hopefully see just the most recent updates um, with some more details if they want to access them, um, hopefully allowing them to you know, get, get the most up-to-date information on COVID without bombarding them with email. So the response to this has been overall pretty positive thus far. 
And so switching to pre-procedural testing for just a couple of minutes, um, our policy is that all patients must receive a COVID test within three days of a procedure. Um, initially, we were using a 72-hour um, a policy, um, but this led to sort of unnecessarily challenging situations where a delay in um, a case could mean that something was taking, you know, 75 hours since the last case instead of 72 hours. Um, and it seems sort of silly to wait um, you know, and get a retest just because of that delay. And so we found that using a, a three-day uh, policy has been, you know, easier to implement than, than 72 hours. Um, and so the COVID test is ordered by the proceduralist, who also performs a COVID uh, symptom screen at the time that the test is being ordered. And so um, the patient can go to a local testing site anywhere uh, within the Mass General Brigham network to get their test. Uh, regardless of whether their procedure will be uh, done at that site or any other place within our hospital network. And so our patients are also um, advised to self-quarantine between the tests and their procedure, and then the patient uh, receives one final symptom screen uh, the day of the procedure. If the test and the screen are negative, um, then normal procedural precautions are used with simple surgical masks rather than N95s for everyone. Um, this allows substantial saving of PPE. Uh, if the test or the screen is positive, then clinical discretion is used about whether the procedure can be reasonably delayed. Uh, if a delay won't hurt the patient, the procedure is postponed until the patient is cleared of COVID. Uh, if a delay would be harmful to the patient, then the procedure is performed with enhanced respiratory precautions. Uh, it is also worth noting that the use of our enhanced respiratory precautions during procedures is only allowed and available at our hospital sites. Um, our ambulatory surgery centers are only performing procedures on patients who have been cleared of COVID risk. Uh, in order to keep these facilities infection free. Finally, uh, it is worth noting that the current system is quite cumbersome um, and time intensive to coordinate. Uh, contacting patients at all of the needed points for testing and scheduling has been complicated. Uh, one thing that would help is if the EHR was able to link a COVID test with a procedure, uh, such that canceling the procedure would cancel the testing appointment uh, and the test result could inform the procedure site and schedule. We've asked our EHR company uh, to build this capability. Uh, we're hoping that they will be able to soon. Um, and perhaps if you're facing something similar uh, and you ask for the same solution, uh, maybe this will happen. And so uh, I'm going to stop here, but I'm, ha I'm happy to answer any questions about the specifics of what I've spoken about um, or any other areas of testing that I might not have covered. Uh, so thank you very much. Great. Thank you both so much. for. So really quickly, I want to touch um, on some of the resources that NewTech has to offer for you, and then we will go into a little bit of question and answers. So just as a reminder, we did answer quite a few of them in real time, but if you have questions, uh, please submit them in the Q&A on the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to them shortly. Again, NewTech is here to help. I mentioned earlier that we have a website um, at www.newtech.org, and then also if you have specific questions, please feel free to email us at info at newtech.org. We continuously update our information and build new resources for you. So I'm going to um, say a few of these questions out loud and then pitch them to our two speakers and let them answer. Um, some of them, one of you answered and the other one may have a little bit of input, so I might um, pitch it that way as well. Um, I think for um, Dr. Boss, um, someone had asked, Oh, as the questions are coming in, they're going everywhere. Um, Pre-procedural testing within 72 hours, does that also apply for patients who previously tested positive? So, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so we have this sort of COVID recovered status and um, if patients have been re considered recovered by our clinical criteria, meaning that they've um, been symptom free for 72 hours and um, you know, are at least 14 days from when we think that they uh, started to have COVID, um, you know, we know that they're going to be shedding for at least probably 60 days. We are not retesting them if they are asymptomatic in that time period. If they are beyond that time period, since we don't yet know whether people can get COVID again, um, we are retesting at that point. Great. Um, and for both of you, since it might be different at your institutions, have you collected saliva samples instead of NP and found any differences in your testing results? At Emory, we prefer the nasopharyngeal swab um, rather than an oral swab or saliva. Um, so we haven't done a lot of studying of the saliva test. Yeah, we, we've started to do some uh, internal testing comparing the saliva test and the nasopharyngeal swab, but we don't yet have the data to say that the, that the saliva test is um, adequately the same. We're hoping that it may, but we're not there yet. Great. 
Um, kind of a two-part question. Um, both of you kind of alluded to this in each of your presentations, but Annette asks, how long can you test positive for COVID-19? How long are you contagious? Um, and a lot of times now the recommendation is you can't go back to work until you test negative. So what is your recommendation? So it's a bit of a loaded question. I think the full answer is no one's 100% sure. Um, but we think that you can test positive for quite some time due to viral genetic material um, that may not actually represent infectious variants. Um, so we are following the CDC guidance, um, which is that it has to be at least 10 days from onset of first symptom and at least three days from onset of resol from resolution of your last symptom before um, return to work. Dr. Bob, do you have anything to add? No, it's um, similar. You know, we don't know for sure the answer, but we, we too have decided that um, you know, symptomatic criteria make sense. And so, you know, as I mentioned, we're using some, um, sort of similar that it's been, you know, two weeks since onset of symptoms or discharge from a hospital and at least 72 hours with no symptoms. Um, we're not requiring testing, at least of our employees uh, at this point to go back to work. Great, thank you. Um, specifically, a question about Mass General. Are you performing routine testing 24-7? Uh, yes, we are. Our, our lab is running tests overnight, um, so we are getting those 24-7. Um, they did not ask about Emory, but I would like to hear about Emory and Grady, please. Um, for our testing at Emory, we are not running the, the, te the batch test overnight, so it's run several times per day, but not overnight. Um, and then for both of you, I'll let Dr. Bago first, but um, what were your asymptomatic high-risk groups that you are testing? Sure. Um, so the high-risk categories for us are homeless patients, those who are receiving hemodialysis at a, uh, at a facility, um, those coming from any kind of congregate living setting, anyone who's had a known exposure to a COVID-positive patient in the last two weeks, and then anybody who can't give a full history, um, even if they don't have symptoms, we're testing them and treating them like they might have COVID. And ours are similar to that. Um, so especially patients who have an unexplained downtime or can't give a response, the hemodialysis, the long-term care facilities, and then some of our, on our hematology, oncology patients, they will request testing on, um, especially since they are immunocompromised. So as you guys are seeing, you see a little bit of similarity and a slight difference. So that's why I keep having them both um, answer because I think it's a really great comparison. Um, I'll let um, either one of you answer first, but uh, with universal patient testing, are you still utilizing respirator precautions for aerosolizing procedures? So I think this is a good question. Um, so for our universal patient testing, we're not considering the nasopharyngeal swab um, truly an aerosol generating procedure. So for asymptomatic patients that um, our, our providers can collect that swab using a surgical mask and eye protection, um, and that is also done in the clinic. Um, so however, for an aerosol generating procedure, we're trying to avoid aerosol generating procedures in general, such as BiPAP, nebulizers, and high flow um, nasal cannula. If those patients do use those um, procedures, we will place them ideally in a room by themselves and use our um, COVID level PPE until the swab comes back. Yeah, and, and for us, we too consider um, nasal swab not exactly an aerosol gener generating procedure, although our nurses actually generally are wearing N95s for collecting those tests still. Um, in terms of AGPs across the whole hospital, our policy is that if someone is considered COVID risk, hasn't been ruled out for COVID, or certainly if they have COVID, um, we are using full respir respirator precautions. However, uh, for patients who have been cleared of COVID, um, we're actually doing our AGPs with them um, with normal precautions and just with a surgical mask. And that's both in the, in the procedural setting and in the ED and in the hospital. I know that's been a really hot topic lately. So thank you for your responses. I think we have a couple more uh, that we have time for. Um, if you guys know, I don't know if each of you know, but um, the question came through from Grover about what volume of testing are you each doing in a 24 hour period? 
That's a good question. Um, I'm not <laughs> sure, but one of my colleagues has just informed me we are doing 2,000 per day. Yeah, um, I know in the emergency department, we're running about 200, and um, within the hospitals, about another 100 a day. But system wide, I actually don't know. Um, my guess is it's um, somewhere in the, in, in the multi thousands. Um, and just a few more. Um, do you require employees who have tested household positive contacts to be tested as well before they return to work? I'll let Anna answer first. So because of our community prevalence, we're basically asking our healthcare workers to monitor their symptoms at home. Additionally, recently we have gone to uh, a app for symptom screening um, and temperature checks uh, prior to um, beginning a day of work. So just like uh, exposure in the hospital and exposure in the community is considered the same way, as long as our healthcare providers are asymptomatic and remain um, fever-free on our screens, they're able to work. And our policy is similar. Uh, we too are having people attest to their symptoms every day before they come into the hospital. And so um, we're not requiring people with sick family members necessarily to get tested. Um, our employee testing has been based only on symptoms um, at this point. Earlier in the pandemic, we were doing things like that, uh, but we're not now. Great, I think we have time for about two more. So a couple people have asked, um, do you have any recommend recommendations for testing students coming back to college campuses in the fall? Any thoughts around that? And I'll let Dr. Ball go first. Oh, um, I think that's a good question. <laughs> Sorry uh, about I'm that. not sure that anybody, <laughs> yeah. anybody sort of has a, a clean answer for it. Um, I think, you know, this is just, this is just personal opinion, um, particularly given high prevalence rates, you know, in various states. Um, there's certainly a risk of asymptomatic college students um, you know, bringing infection to a campus and having that spread. So if it were feasible to have uh, people get tested before they came on a campus, I think that could be ideal. I don't know if that's going to be feasible, in which case it may just need to be um, based on symptoms. Um, and again, sort of depends on the amount of good social distancing and, and mask wearing that can happen. Um, at Emory, we have a task force that has been um, st stood up across institution to discuss return to school for our um, students. And you're right, it takes, oh, there's a lot of considerations, including how to test, when to test, um, how to recommend social distancing, where you put people who need to be isolated um, because they're symptomatic or quarantined, how you contact trace. So it's a very complex issue that is being handled um, by um, many academic institutions. But in general, that does include a component of testing prior to return and then potentially interval testing either in association with contact tracing or um, at different intervals um, throughout the school year. If, there is a return to school. And for our last question, um, either one of you can answer, but we've had a couple questions around um, NAIR testing versus NP testing and the accuracy of just getting the anterior NAIR swab versus the deep um, NP swab. Can either of you comment on the accuracy of that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so Ready, I, go. <laughs> I can, um, say I am not 100% confident in my answer. I have heard from our infection preventionists that they prefer the deep um, NP swabs, but I have also read some small um, publications in peer-reviewed journals that have suggested that the anterior NARES is an acceptable alternative. Part of the reason it, um, it, is it depends on the type of testing that you're running, the type of um, specimen that is required. Yeah, my, my experience is similar. Um, at least with the initial assay we had, our ID experts were fairly adamant that the, the deep NP swab was preferable to the NAIR testing, but with some of the newer assays we've gotten, similar to saliva, we've been um, initiating some studies to try and compare um, the accuracy of the two, um, but I don't have any of those yet. Great, and I think you'll find that similar information across um, the U.S., but lots of research studies going on currently. So um, thank you both so much for your um, time and willingness to answer those questions. Uh, we are on social media, so please join us. Uh, please join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Uh, we do have several YouTube videos that are skill videos um, on our YouTube Almost channel there, so feel free to subscribe. 
Also, we do have several online courses that go more in depth um, into things of um, emerging infectious diseases. And again, all of our information down there is at the bottom. So I'd really like to thank Dr. Yaffe and Dr. Ba today for coming on and giving us a wonderful insight into their institution's um, testing strategies. And we hope that everybody has um, a great day and will join us next time for our next webinar. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.